So let's go back to the history. So phosphorylase kinase is the kinase that phosphorylates uh, uh, glycogen phosphorylase. And then the second one to be discovered is called PKA, or cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase. And I'm going to tell you about those two and show you how, in this case, they work together as a team to regulate this biological event. So here's um, glycogen phosphorylase. When you've just had a carbohydrate-rich meal, it's glucose is high, insulin is high, glucagon is low. Insulin and glucagon are our two metabolic hormones that tell the body, um, are we in an energy-rich state with glucose, or are we in more of a fasting state? So it's turned off. Then you look at glycogen phosphorylase, it's turned off. You have lots of glucose, you want to be making glycogen, not breaking it down. Okay, now you look at when blood glucose levels are low, you have high glucagon, low insulin. This case, you want to mobilize that glycogen that's stored in the liver, and then this enzyme is turned on. And it's turned on by the addition of that one phosphate to each of the chains in, in um, the glycogen phosphorylase dimer. Okay, so let's see how that works. So here's glucagon. Glucagon is a hormone. It doesn't ever get into the cell. It binds to a receptor uh, on the surface of the liver cell. And in this case, this is a, a GPCR, a G-protein coupled receptor, the largest gene family in our human genome. Um, it binds. That couples to a heterotrimeric G-protein, which becomes activated. And that, in turn, leads to the activation of adenylate cyclase, which makes cyclic AMP. So this concept is cyclic AMP is a second messenger. It allows some extracellular signal to be translated into a biological response. This was discovered by Earl Sutherland earlier in the 1950s, um, uh, this second messenger concept for cyclic AMP. It is conserved as a second messenger in all of biology, even in bacteria. Um, so let's see what it this is summarizing what I just told you. Your extracellular signal, in this case glucagon, a hormone from the pancreas, binds the glucagon receptor, activates the G-alpha subunit, that activates um, adenylate cyclase and makes cyclic AMP. Okay, what does cyclic AMP do? Okay, so let's look now at this biological response. So here we go to PKA, and PKA, like most protein kinases, I told you they're switches, it's kept in an, in an off state um, here, and in this case it's got regulatory R subunits and catalytic subunits, um, C subunits, and when they're together and there's no cyclic AMP around, it is inactive, it's turned off. And cyclic AMP, this is a main target for cyclic AMP, these regulatory subunits of PKA. It binds with very high affinity to the regulatory subunit, and that then unleashes the catalytic activity. And depending on the cell type, there are many things it can do. PKA has many substrates. It regulates many aspects of biology. Um, it can also go into the nucleus and turn on gene transcription. So, turning on one kinase can have many, many consequences. We're going to focus here on this liver cell and what are the consequences for glycogen metabolism. So let's look at this cyclic AMP. It gets made in response to glucagon. It binds to PKA and it converts it from an inactive state to an active state. Okay, what does that do now with respect to glycogen metabolism? Well, glycogen phosphorylase kinase, that was the first kinase that Krebs and Fisher um, characterized. That's the kinase that um, phosphorylates glycogen phosphorylase, and PKA turns it from an off state to an on state. So we now have one kinase, PKA, turning on another kinase, glycogen phosphorylase kinase. And then, um, that, in turn, acts on glycogen phosphorylase. And again, that's converting it from an inactive state um, to an active state. So these switches, on-off switches, are happening all the time in, in our cells. So, and in these cases, it's just one phosphate. One single phosphate can make an enormous difference for a very large protein, whether it's active or whether it's inactive.